So I'd now like to ask our final speaker for the morning, Sir Mark Feldman, to come forward. And he's going to talk about lessons from anti-TNF therapy, which links well with the previous presentation. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, the Gairdner Awards uh, are stellar, important uh, prizes, and uh, Tanya and I are very pleased to join the group uh, uh, of people reward this prize. Um, in previous uh, award lectures, Tanya and I did a bit of a duo, this splitting preclinical and clinical, uh, but we thought um, that we'd do something more challenging this time. Uh, so Tiny, um, being the o older gentleman, uh, retired somewhat earlier than me, uh, got to talk about all the things that did work uh, and I'll try and tell you that there are interesting things in the pipeline uh, that haven't worked, uh, but uh, with a bit of uh, luck, stamina, who knows, uh, uh, probably the most important will be good colleagues uh, may well work in the future. So what I'd like to address is uh, what have we learned from anti-TNF therapy that may propel uh, a treatment in the future? And the challenges really, I think, is that uh, we can ameliorate rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases, but we are nowhere yet near a cure. And this has been the status quo for more than a decade. It's a status quo which the pharmaceutical industry is quite happy with. Uh, as you were told, sales, uh, uh, anti-TNF is the world's leading, most profitable drug class, uh, surpassed statins in 2012. Uh, but that, of course, is not uh, a satisfactory sort of situation for the patients. Now, there has been, a, in the last few years, a lot of discussion that animal models of disease uh, don't really give much insight uh, into uh, uh, pathogenic mechanisms that translate into therapy. And what I've with Tiny has described for you is an adventure in which uh, the really detailed analysis of a human disease site uh, gave us a lot of insight uh, and a uh, major therapy. So the other question I'd like to address is what other diseases can we study uh, and de develop therapeutic targets and therapy uh, using human disease tissue? So you've seen part of this slide. We keep on recycling our slides. Uh, uh, this, but, you know, fortunately, these patients in the walking frames and wheelchairs uh, no longer populate our clinics. But there are certainly problems with anti-TNF therapy. Uh, not all patients respond. Those that respond are not cured. They're partial. They're improved. Uh, there are side effects. Uh, uh, and really, the cost of therapy leads to rationing. And this is uh, especially uh, acute in Canada. Uh, from a relative, uh, I found out that the rationing of anti-TNF uh, is even more effective in Canada than in the UK. So I'm not sure that that's something to be that proud of, uh, but there are many other things to be proud of. So this is to summarize a, a little bit of where we are. In typical clinical trial results, 50% improvement happens in only about 40% of patients. So really, this is a very dramatic description that we have a partial response uh, and uh, uh, the patients would definitely like to do better. And uh, this is a summary from many diff clinical trials with different anti-TNF therapeutics. Uh, and as uh, Tiny described, in routine care, uh, low disease activity is only in about half of patients. Uh, and this is a slide borrowed from my colleague, Peter Taylor, uh, who inherited the clinic from Tiny when he retired. Uh, and shown here is clinical trial data uh, from five different anti-TNFs. These are different patient populations, so the numbers are not, uh, uh, this doesn't, you can't tell that there's any significant difference. Uh, and this is other therapeutics. Uh, and so uh, the current state of the art, uh, profitable though it be, it is a very partial success. So how might we do better? And as always in science and medicine, 
Uh, the grass is green on the other side of the fence. Looking around uh, gives you clues. And some of the biggest medical successes of recent years has been combination therapy for life-threatening and life-ending diseases, HIV, some leukemias. And I think in HIV, it's very well described. One drug, AZT, had a minimal effect. Two drugs was getting encouraging. But as soon as we got to triple therapy, the patients started complaining of their side effects. They knew they weren't dying anymore. And the same is true for a variety of leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, the very rapid death sentence has been mitigated uh, by combination therapy. But there are risks of combination therapy, uh, and the most obvious is uh, risk of infection. Um, and uh, in the rheumatological literature, uh, attempts to do combination therapy in the biological era uh, was not very um, uh, cleverly done. And it's, had, uh, it's impacted the field uh, because, uh, uh, for example, clinical trials of etanercept and anakinra, uh, two biological agents which interact with biological pathways with probably 95% overlap. Uh, this did not yield any increased efficacy, but it yielded uh, a markedly increased rate of infection. Or etanercept and abatacept, uh, which blocks the early events in the immune response, again had no enhanced efficacy, but enhanced infectious risk. So companies uh, that initially did this became discouraged. Uh, but we do have evidence, even if it's a little bit uh, self-serving, uh, that uh, combination therapy is possible. Uh, Anti-TNF and methotrexate has enhanced efficacy without, uh, uh, so far, any evidence of enhanced toxicity. So it's possible, and I think uh, uh, we have to be a little bit more uh, clever about what combinations. But I think from this example, that targeting pathways that are too similar uh, doesn't yield benefit. Uh, what we need to do is to combine pathways which uh, have target very different processes uh, then we, that, that may not be, uh, that may show an increased efficacy but without increased risk. But there are going to be big challenges. Uh, the regulatory authorities uh, uh, need a lot of toxicity studies. Uh, there are legal issues if the drugs belong to different companies who's liable to the problems. Uh, but these things have been solved in the cancer field quite routinely. Uh, the costs of combination therapy uh, will be an issue. Um, how can, might we predict responders? Uh, and, but I think the one step forward that has been made is that there are better tools to monitor human immune function. Uh, this has been pioneered by Mark Davis, and this will help us uh, to reduce the infectious risk. So what might this look like? So this is, uh, uh, this is the, the two uh, clinical trials I discussed with you that failed, uh, and the reasons with the pathways were probably too close uh, for added benefit. Um, so the Therapies that we might consider, if we consider where we've got to today, uh, anti-TNF and methotrexate uh, as the standard of care, uh, which it is at least uh, very well documented by the sales, uh, other anti-inflammatory agents like Actemra uh, have sales that are about 5% of those of anti-TNF. So clearly, patients not doing well enough on this combination would be the biggest unmet need, the biggest pool of patients we want to treat. So there are already, there are a number of ideas and I'll discuss these a little bit with you. One of which is to reduce inflammation and immunity in a rational way. Uh, our colleague Richard Williams showed in mice that anti-TNF uh, upregulates R17. Uh, I'll show you this. Uh, and there are companies now uh, starting clinical trials of anti-TNF and anti-R17 in a way I wouldn't recommend using a bifunctional antibody with a dosing 
of the drugs uh, at fixed ratio. Uh, and um, uh, there is evidence that uh, regulatory T cells and other immunoregulatory pathways are abnormal. Uh, there are ways in which these could be restored. But the approaches that I like the most, uh, because uh, theory, we don't understand how they would promote infectious risk, would be targeting aspects of a disease process that are not at all immune uh, or inflammatory. And there are two approaches. The one that's very uh, topical here is to reduce angiogenesis. There is a large mass of inflammatory tissue. Uh, it is certainly very well-known angiogenesis in rheumatoid arthritis. And my colleague, Eva Palulog, has studied this for a long time and has shown that a variety of ways of blocking VEGF uh, with antibodies, with uh, receptors, uh, all of these are effective in reducing arthritis. Uh, she's also done some experiments, uh, still unpublished, uh, showing that there is a combinational effect of anti-TNF with anti-VEGF in uh, an animal model of arthritis. So uh, we think that this is an approach, and the key issue would be to establish which anti-angiogenic uh, pathway and therapeutic is uh, likely to be the safest to use uh, in these inflammatory patients. Because the tolerance of uh, a patient's doing relatively well to toxicity is a lot less than the tolerance of cancer patients. Another approach is to target the fibroblast-like synoviocytes, the stroma. Uh, there's increasing awareness of the importance of stroma in all sorts of diseases. And of course, there is a very rich literature uh, that these are very important in the disease process. Um, and uh, as far as we know, targeting the fibroblast-like synoviocytes uh, should not increase infectious risk. Uh, but since these are involved in the tissue destruction, they make a large amount of the uh, in destructive enzymes. Uh, this uh, uh, should have a combinatorial effect. And at the, Ken at the Kennedy Institute, there is a group led by Yoshi Ito that's looked at MMP14. They've showed that this is effective in uh, <coughs> animal models of arthritis. And they've also shown a combinational effect uh, with uh, anti-TNF. So this, uh, these pathways uh, may well be the most easy to move forward uh, because the um, hypothetical risk of infection is least. Um, Mike Brenner has uh, uh, clearly demonstrated the importance of coherent 11 and that would be another approach that might be possible. But there are other approaches. For example, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. Reducing antigen load uh, is a possible approach. Uh, and of course, if everything fails, you go back to the drawing board and look for new clues. So just to make some of these, uh, uh, these approaches less hypothetical, this is my colleague, Richard Williams. <coughs> he did the first uh, mouse experiments on uh, TNF therapy with us uh, uh, more than 20 years ago. And this shows you a mouse that's responding well to anti-TNF, but it upregulates IL-17. And uh, uh, this uh, can be, it also, the mechanism uh, of this is probably by the upregulating, uh, upregulation of a P40 chain. Thank you. Um, which is common to IL-12 and IL-23. Um, uh, and so this predicts that combination therapy might more, be more effective, uh, and he's tested this. This is anti-IL-17 uh, anti in the mouse model, anti-TNF and the combination, uh, and this is IL-23. So this uh, potential synergy uh, is possible, can be demonstrated in the mouse. However, uh, the, the potential infectious risk here by blocking uh, uh, several pathways of host defense uh, would not make this a, a favorite choice. Certainly not for continuous blockade. Uh, it could be that intermittent blockade of R17 
uh, in patients that have, you can demonstrate, been upregulated, might be safe. So all this is in mice, but it's also true in humans, a variable upregulation of R17 after anti-TNF in rheumatoid and ankylosing spondylitis patients. Uh, another approach which I'm pleased to show in Canada, this is uh, work in collaboration with Trillium, a small company based in the Toronto area. Um, and it's, uh, it's activating an endogenous immunoregulatory pathway. CD200 receptor is expressed mostly on uh, uh, macrophages and antigen-presenting cells. It's activated by CD200. Trillium made a fusion protein of this, uh, and uh, Richard and I were involved in testing this. And you can see here a dose response has an effect in mice, uh, just at the high dose as good as anti-TNF. The mechanism is a bit different. It's by upregulating uh, immunosuppressive factors like interleukin-10. Uh, regrettably, this has never made it uh, uh, to the clinic. Um, Another approach is to reduce antigen load. So this is a holy grail of uh, immunotherapy, remove the antigens, uh, very uh, much easier said than done. But with the um, pioneering work of Walter Van Roy, uh, who first uh, documented that the autoantigens in rheumatoid arthritis uh, are uh, 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 post-translational modifications of common proteins, They've lost in a minor group, um, and there's a number of these. Uh, the most important of one is probably enolase, discovered by our colleague Patrick Venables. And the evidence that's probably the most important is not only genetic risk, but also if hybridomas are made from activated B cells in joints. This is the work of Lars Klariskog and his colleagues in Sweden. The majority of them recognize, produce anti enolase so, But with the, um, so the hypothesis would be that reducing these antigens uh, would reduce autoimmunity. Uh, it may not be a very rapid onset of benefit, but uh, uh, you know, it's certainly an experiment worth testing. And it would be done by blocking the enzymes that remove the uh, amino groups. Uh, there's f um, uh, four or five of these in mammals and one in bacteria involved in uh, uh, chronic gingivitis. And it's known historically since the time of Hippocrates uh, of the link between periodontal disease uh, and arthritis. And um, if all else fails, and this is a project we've started, uh, then one goes empirical and asks, what's still active in patients not doing well? Uh, and this is a challenging experiment uh, due to the limited size of samples, uh, but I think it is approachable now, and we've started, uh, we're using uh, very small biopsies for metacarpophalangeal joints, and the Cytop machine, uh, uh, also developed by, in Toronto uh, by Scott Tanner, uh, and, but uh, whose use was uh, uh, very high, well demonstrated by Gary Nolan in a series of uh, landmark papers. So the conclusion of this part of my discussion is that uh, understanding of pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis does permit ex uh, effective therapy, uh, but we're not we're near getting, we need to get closer to a cure. Uh, this is challenging, but I think is certainly possible if one uh, approaches it rationally. Uh, and there's going to be a number of approaches, uh, but predicting which one will work is certainly beyond me. Um, what I want to turn to is uh, to discuss work uh, that's done by a number of colleagues uh, that I've been helping uh, to look at other local uh, diseases where we can get access to human tissue uh, and uh, we can try and define therapeutic targets. So the two colleagues I've been uh, uh, helping are Claudia Monaco and Jagdeep Nanchahal, and they're tackling a major uh, health problems. This is a disease uh, that will kill the majority more than any other disease uh, in the Western world. 
uh, fractures are very common. 80% of people get at least one fracture in their lifetime, and fibrosis is a very clear unmet need. So this is um, an immunohistological picture showing HLA-DR expression in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and this was a very pivotal uh, image in uh, convincing us that the cytokines were an important potential target because they are the regulators of HLA expression. Uh, and this is atherosclerosis, uh, just to show you that uh, there are also activated antigen-presenting cells and lymphocytes. So uh, by serendipity, uh, uh, this young woman, uh, Claudia Monica, arrived uh, uh, probably more than 13 years ago uh, to learn uh, from my colleagues, uh, especially Fanula Brennan, how to isolate uh, activated cells from a human autoimmune, from the human lesion, and analyze what these cells were doing, what mediators, as that showed so that she could do this. She was a cardiologist uh, working with Attila Mazzeri and wanted to uh, mimic our studies in joints with vascular tissue. This proved to be slightly more challenging than she thought, uh, and uh, to cut a long story short, uh, uh, she's still with us because the problem uh, was a bit too uh, challenging uh, to solve uh, uh, in a small, less well-equipped lab in Italy. But essentially what she's found is that it, uh, with attention to detail, you can get cells out alive, uh, you can analyze them, you can uh, put them in culture, uh, and then you find uh, that they do produce a lot of inflammatory mediators, and not su surprisingly, uh, not that much less than the rheumatoid joint. Uh, and so the question was, what drives TNF? What are the drivers in this disease? And uh, uh, what she's found in terms of therapeutic targets, I uh, uh, won't show you any NF-kappa B data, but this is to show you that uh, the cytokine production in these, uh, room, in these uh, cultures of atherosclerotic plaques were very dramatically uh, inhibited by antibodies to TL TLR receptor 2. Now, TLR2 will protect you from pneumonia and TB, so I think uh, long-term blockade of this uh, target for atherosclerosis may um, propel you from one problem to another problem that might even be worse. But uh, the uh, stage she's at now is defining what are the ligands for TLR2 are present uh, in atherosclerotic plaques because then that really would be uh, a breakthrough therapeutic target. And my colleague, Jagdeep Nachahal, is an academic surgeon, and some of you will know that these are very rare uh, endangered species. And um, when I took over from Tiny, we wanted to do something a little bit different, and that was to encourage, to look at a broader spectrum of musculoskeletal diseases and look at them also from the surgeon's point of view. So we hired this gentleman, one of the few academic surgeons in our field, uh, we knew about and encouraged him to work on whatever he felt uh, the urge to do so because we wanted to study other diseases. So he picked two clinical problems that he was doing routinely. Um, uh, fibrosis of the hand, he's a hand surgeon and so he'd been giving us a lot of surgical tissue from joints uh, and fractures. And uh, this, I'll tell you a little bit about his work on Dupuytren's disease which we hope will go to clinical trial uh, next year. So it's a very common fibrosis, certainly northern Europeans, um, but uh, you know, several percent of the population has this common um, Dupuytren's fibrosis. Uh, and this is, uh, can be quite debilitating, especially in this era, era of um, uh, computers and uh, iPhones, etc. And uh, what he did was by, to, to um, take the tissue out at surgery, as is the common treatment, uh, and study it in detail. So there's a nodule um, which um, is still very cellular, 
in the, and that's what drives the contracture. So he studied uh, uh, what they, what's present, and there's a small number of macrophages and a, lot of, and a large number of myofibroblasts expressing smooth muscle actin. The macrophages make our familiar cytokines, uh, uh, TNFR6 and so on, uh, and you can see here the macrophages. Uh, uh, and what he was able to show is that it's TNF which is responsible for uh, both sustaining the myofibroblast lineage, but actually for driving the contraction. What this experiment shows uh, is a bit of epigenetics, that the palmar fibroblast uh, can be converted to myofibroblast by TNF and they contract in an individual that already has the disease. However, uh, the, um, uh, the palmar fibroblast from an individual that doesn't have the disease uh, is not converted into myofibroblasts uh, by a TNF. And the non palmar fibroblasts of an individual with dupotrens are again not sensitive uh, to TNF. Uh, and this is, and uh, what this suggested was that uh, TNF was important still in the late stages of a disease. Um, and so that um, anti-TNF might be useful. And this is the result of injecting anti-TNF into the cords in vitro. Um, it interferes with the contraction of these cords. And you can see the histology, the nicely lined up a smooth muscle action in the myofibroblast and the disorganization with anti-TNF. So this is uh, going to go into clinical trial uh, next year. Uh, uh, Jack Deep and I got a grant from the Wellcome Trust Department of Health for doing so. This is the other problem that um, Jack Deep um, was uh, studying, open fractures of the tibia. Um, and um, uh, these heal very poorly, um, uh, tip median a uh, healing time in the, uh, the UK is about 42 weeks. So in this time, your chance of keeping your job and um, your partner is quite uh, small. Uh, the partner is probably also because of the uh, typical phenotype of a person who gets this injury. This is classically a motorbike injury. Um, and of course, uh, you have to do a very large uh, clean up. So what is do we do with this thing? Um, you take out a lot of tissue uh, and that may be why uh, the uh, healing is stopped. But of course uh, bone repair is important in many other instances. Uh, this is a joint uh, prosthesis where you can see the loosening. Um, so he started his study by taking fragments from these fractures, collecting supernatants, and then he was able to show that uh, they were making, uh, super, the supernatants had activities which could convert uh, stromal cells into bone. So there was bone forming activity <coughs> being produced and he wanted to understand where it came from. So of interest was that the bone forming activity came from the injured bone, <coughs> but surgically sliced bone did not produce it. With monoclonal antibodies, he studied what this was, and it turned out not to be what was expected. Uh, members of a TGF uh, beta or bone morphogenic protein family, it turned out to be TNF. And uh, this is just to show that recombinant TNF uh, uh, stimulates uh, osteogenesis uh, as measured by alkaline phosphatase. Um, um, and so this has led to experiments to see whether adding TNF to fractures would enhance uh, uh, bone formation, uh, and in the mouse model it does. Um, and very interestingly, it also does in, um, in a mouse model of fragility fracture. And as you know, fragility fractures um, 
are a very major problem, increasing as our population ages uh, and is a very common cause of death in the elderly after hip fracture. Uh, and this is just to show uh, that again, uh, a TNF injection into this osteoporotic mouse accelerates uh, the formation of bone, uh, which doesn't overgrow. So uh, you get to the same equilibrium, but you just get there quicker. So I've discussed uh, a number of projects with you. Uh, none of these are a fraction as good as the projects uh, that we've completed and uh, Tiny has described. But I, th I hope I've convinced you that uh, there are approaches that could be added on to standard of care that should take us closer to a cure for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and if uh, there's enough conviction in the community that we have to do better, then I think the resources for more complicated and challenging clinical trials uh, will emerge. But I also hope I've convinced you that the approach of using human disease tissue for molecular analysis and the unraveling of targets uh, uh, can be used for many more diseases. Uh, and while the examples I've shown you uh, haven't yet come to fruition, um, we have to be uh, optimistic that some of them will. As always, uh, uh, the work which you get shown uh, involves many others. Uh, Tiny and I uh, have worked very happily together for 30 years. Um, regrettably, Fanula Brennan uh, died of breast cancer a couple of years ago. And here are some of the other colleagues whose work I've described. Thank you.